So I thought I would do something rather different from what the previous speakers have done. And I would concentrate exclusively on Dick's work before the momentous events of 1997, which I remember very well, where he discovered, it's a un discovery unique to him, the Hopf algebra of the uh, uh, renormalization by iterated subtraction of subdivergences. And I've chosen two topics, knots and numbers and four term relations that you can find in his book, the only book that Dirk has published, it's called Knots and Feynman Diagrams. Uh, you saw a picture of the cover in Mark's talk. Uh, and one of these I've characterized as being not even wrong. It wasn't sufficiently well-defined to be turned into something you can say, yes, this emphatically does or does not work. But it was extremely important as a heuristic. Without it, we would not have arrived at our conjectured enumeration of multiple zeta values by weight and by depth. And we certainly wouldn't have uh, been able to uh, evaluate uh, uh, as many counter terms and, and seven loop fight of the fourth as we did exactly and uh, remaining numerically. But before that, uh, you have to remember I'm talking about things during Dirk's first postdoctoral appointment in, uh, in Tasmania. Before that, I thought I would talk about his graduate work. You've heard an awful lot uh, of uh, appreciation for the way that he advises students. Uh, I use that word advisedly. You should think of him as an advisor, not a supervisor. So I'm going to say a little bit about his time as a graduate student. Now, I was a regular visitor to the University of Mainz, working with my good friend Karl Schilcher throughout the 1980s. And um, towards the end of that, I think it was 1989, Carl said, you have to come. We have this new wunderkind called Dirk Kreimer. He hasn't got an undergraduate degree in mathematics or in physics. He studied humanities. But somehow he seems to have mastered the whole of Landau and Lifshitz and uh, passed all, uh, all Binder's examinations. And uh, I've given him this problem to work, but he keeps going off with his own ideas please come and visit and see if they make any sense to you. And so during Dirk's graduate work, these are some of the things that I learned from him. I also was able to give him advice, but they contributed to my education. The first one which I've mentioned here is a problem of gamma five. This is the matrix which in four dimensions uh, commutes with the full Clifford at the four matrices of the Clifford algebra and you just make it by multiplying the four of them together. Uh, but um, Carl Schilker had given Dirk uh, a really rather neat problem, which he finally got around to, uh, to answering. And that is, is the weak interaction at one loop multiplicatively renormalizable rather than subtractively renormalizable? Uh, and that's a, a non-trivial question. Um, but Dick immediately saw that there's something very, very different about the weak interaction from all the other interactions. The fact that it doesn't conserve parity means that you have to calculate uh, traces of gamma matrices with an odd number of gamma fives. And there was a long standing prescription uh, going back to shortly after the introduction of dimensional regularization by Atuft and Veltman in 1977, I think it was. Uh, Breitlohner and Maison gave a prescription for this, um, which they claimed uh, would eventually work, um, but it was extremely inconvenient. It separated gamma matrices into four dimensional ones and extra dimensional ones. Uh, anti commutivity of gamma five was lost. E evanescent operators uh, 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 appeared, and uh, order by order, the, the, the fundamental aspect of uh, a gauge theory, BRST invariance, was not preserved. You had to uh, perform finite renormalizations and do it by hand. So this young graduate student, his first publication, if you go to his um, homepage and look at his publications, is a, a, a novel approach to this problem. And he, he, he recognized that something had to be abandoned. I mean, the existence of anomaly uh, was responsible for the decay of the pi zero to two photons. The fact that you cannot have a one identity for the uh, uh, one loop diagram that couples two vector currents to an axial current uh, tells you that there's something really 
different going on with an odd number of gamma phi's matrices. He didn't want to abandon anti, uh, 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 anti commutation, and he didn't want certainly to go through this nasty separation that uh, was near two Feldman screen. So he had to think, what should we abandon? And he said, well, really, we're dealing with matrices of uh, uh, infinite dimensional matrices. Uh, and for those, we know that we, we shouldn't be insisting on the cyclicity of the trace. So that's what he gave up. And then he had to give reading instructions. If I can't, uh, in my trace, uh, 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 cycle the gamma matrices, where do I start? And he showed that that was consistent with the anomaly. So, so quite a remarkably innovative piece of work, you see, but he'd been given this problem and he'd put his finger on what he thought was the most important thing to address. Now, there was a subsequent paper with Carl Schilke, his supervisor, and with Jorgen Kerner, which uh, 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 as co-authors, and um, this attracted quite a lot of interest. And um, my good friend Jorgen Kerner, I think, would agree with me. He wasn't the best person to go around giving seminars explaining Dirk's work. And eventually he said, no, actually, this comes from uh, Karl Schucher's young graduate student, and if, uh, he can explain it better. And this required Dirk to um, show one of his other talents, and that is the ability to stay calm under pressure because um, one of the two people that I've mentioned that had this 1977 scheme was not well disposed to an unknown graduate student advancing an alternative. So that was rather impressive. The thing that impressed me most was Dick's ability as an analyst. You see, the title of this conference is Algebraic Structures in Quantum Field Theory, but Dick is also very talented when it comes to the analytic structure of it. And I would say, perhaps this is too, uh, not, not very modest thing to say, but I would say that uh, in 1989, I was one of the um, leading practitioners in doing two loop calculations with, uh, with, with different masses. And then Dick um, uh, came and gave a private seminar to Carl and me. And he said, I have a, a new way of doing two loop, two point functions three-point functions of the form factors, and I think I could even do it for double boxes. And his method, uh, which he explained to us very simply, was to split the uh, integrations over the loop momenta into those components that were in the span of the space of the external momenta and do the integrations transverse to those. And he showed how the two loop two point function with five arbitrary masses, a function of five variables, that could be got using skillful use of Cauchy's theorem, taking in Minkowski space, really taking account of where that i epsilon is in, in, in the propagators, could be reduced to a double integral of a beautifully symmetric logarithmic expression. We know that when it's polylogarithmic, it's trilogarithmic, but we know in fact that uh, there's an elliptic obstruction uh, uh, down there as soon as you try to do the next integration. And then, then that was pushed to the three-point functions. Uh, uh, there for the uh, two-loop uh, uh, three-point function, there's a planar and non-planar diagram. Everyone saw the planar diagram is much more difficult than the, uh, the non-planar diagram is much more difficult, but it, it yielded to Dirk's method. Um, so here was really deft analysis uh, and carried through and good programming. Now, I also thought that I knew really quite a lot about special functions, general hypergeometric functions, you know, but this young student said, well, David, yes, I know you know this, but it's all miscellaneous knowledge, you know, you, you got it from Abramovitz and Stegen, and you got them from the Bateman manuscript and the, um, and, uh, the, the, the Russian book, uh, Brichnikov, Marichov, and uh, um, Prudnikov, and, uh, and there was a a manuscript of a very rare list of, uh, 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 of results in the Mainz Library. He said, but what you really need to do is go off and, and read this book, David. And he gave me Carlson's book, which was a, a systematic uh, uh, approach to generalized hypergeometric functions. I think Andre Davidichev mentioned this. So that was um, quite interesting. I mean, when it actually came to doing calculations and, uh, and so on, I. I had things to offer, but here was, uh, here was this graduate student telling me, uh, go off and read this book and I think you'll find it uh, useful. 
And finally, I mentioned, uh, um, it was included in this thesis, when he was looking at uh, uh, form factors with, uh, 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 with different masses in certain situations, when some of the masses go to zero, um, or, or there are collinear momenta, then there are singularities, and he had to start thinking how to regulate those singularities. I'm not talking about renormalization at this stage. And so he asked himself, now, how would it be best to regularize? And he said, oh, David, I'm going to use Hadamard's finite part. Uh, essentially what that means if you have a, uh, a, a, a lower limit of an integral um, goes to zero, things behave badly, you, you, you call that low load epsilon and you throw away not only all uh, powers of one upon epsilon, but also the logarithms that multiply those powers. And uh, it happened recently that Francis Brown was proposing a way to calculate the quasi-periods of modular forms. And uh, he wrote down an integral that was completely undefined. It, 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 it wasn't uh, uh, exponentially uh, uh, divergent in uh, the way that he did it. And, and I said, did you use Hadamard's finite part? And I couldn't get an answer. So uh, Eric and I looked to see whether or not uh, uh, how it would be regulated. And I, and, and I said, well, it must be Hadamard's finite part. And then Eric said, What's that? And I said, well, go and read your, um, uh, your, your supervisor's thesis. It's quite interesting. And he did the calculation and said, yes, it is regulated by what I now know is how advanced find that part. But what I realized, said Eric, is that hyperint, this program you've heard so much about, uses precisely that, uh, that prescription. So I think you can see a picture there, can't you? Independent mind, clear sight. And all done in a calm way. Dick is a very good listener. Uh, I don't know, you know, he listens more than he speaks, and he's good at telling you what he thinks he's clear about and what he's still struggling to understand. Right, so now let's go to Tasmania. What Dick thought was that the momentum flow and Feynman diagrams might be related to knots. Now, this is a, a rather strange thing because. Um, the great thing, a knot is something that is a, a one-dimensional structure in, uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in three dimensions. Um, but this made some sort of sense to me because I could see that um, there was a big difference between planar and non-planar diagrams. Uh, and that's uh, uh, something that's not immediately apparent if you think in four-dimensional space-time. And he told me he could maybe work out which diagrams involved Riemann z through three and which didn't because he could look at the momentum flow and see the trefoil knot, which he wanted to associate with Riemann z through three. Now, the, uh, what he didn't know uh, was that I had done calculations uh, back in 1985 of counterterms, uh, a paper called uh, 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 Scalar Feynman Diagrams, Five Loops and Beyond in which I had uh, identified uh, counterterms involving zeta three and zeta five and zeta seven, um, uh, but also some numbers that I couldn't identify, but I strongly suspected were double sums. So what we were able to do was to test his intuition, the rules that he was developing against case law, which I already had, where it behaved very well, but also to use them to try and uh, uh, work out what analytic expressions to guess analytic expressions using my numerical data so now what i want to do is to tell you what he did i'll read this carefully and then we'll go if we can to look at the figures dick decorated the braids of positive knots and obtained feynman diagrams with trivalent tri vertices he shrank enough edges to obtain some divergence free counter terms forms that I was able to evaluate. So let's let's find, if I go to new share, the theory is that what I have to do is to uh, get out of this loop because they disappear. Ah, I have to, I think, do quite a complicated thing. I have to go down here and find this. So can you now see, is that working? Can you now see some pictures? Hello, can someone yes, tell yes, me? Yes, we can. Yes. Very good, very good. 
Right, so let me go to the first picture. This is a knot. It's one little piece of string and it's got three crossings and you can't undo those crossings. It's the unique knot with three crossings. It's called the trefoil knot. And I've written it down here as a braid. This is just two strands running parallel. And at the end of the day, I'm going to join up these things. So if you see more complicated braids, you can turn them into knots. They might actually turn into links. And what Dick wanted to do was to relate this to zeta three, at three loops in quantum field theory. So he decorated the braid with cords here, and he had a prescription which he explained to me for turning it into this diagram. Now this diagram, uh, we already knew, it, it, it's logarithmically divergent in four dimensions. It has no subdivergences. There's a period, unique period associated with it. We didn't use the word period in those days. And it's, uh, it has the value of six, Riemann's zeta of five. Um, uh, in fact, of the fourth theory, you'd have extra vertices, uh, extra edges, external edges associated here. And uh, to communicate between Tasmania and uh, and the Open University, all he needed to tell me was the, uh, the braid word here. And I asked him for the angular diagram. If we remove, if we say this is the origin and coordinate space, which um, I used almost exclusively and Oliver uh, Schnetz, I think inherited a taste for coordinate space from my early calculations, then uh, we just remove this. And this is the angular diagram. And so you complete the diagram just by connecting the origin to these points. And this is the wheel with three spokes, which gives six Riemann zeta of five. So now let's go to the next one. So now what about uh, six Riemann zeta of three? Now there's also a counter term in, in, in five to the fourth that comes from the wheel with four spokes. You just uh, attach the external edges to the uh, four points on the circumference of that wheel. Uh, but in general, you're not going to find the wheel with five spokes in fight of the fourth theory. You do find zigzag diagrams, which you've heard about, for which Dick and I had a, a conjecture for all loops, later uh, proven by uh, Francis Brown and Oliver Schnett. Um, but how did Dick uh, give me something starting with his knot? Well, here's, he still is dealing just with a two braid, uh, uh, but with more crossings. He ended up with this trivalent diagram and to give me something that I could relate to a counter term, he had to shrink uh, a propagator, turning this into a four point vertex to end up with a wheel with four spokes. Now, this is all plain sailing, but it gets really interesting when we look at three braids where the braid group has two generators saying, so this is saying, Sigma one is happening here and Sigma two is happening here and Sigma two and Sigma two and Sigma one. And they're all positive knots. That means that I have, that these are all over crossings. Um, a huge the number of knots expands uh, um, uh, as prolifically as does the structure of quantum field theory. Uh, but there's a very restricted number of positive knots. And here's an example where using his prescription, he ended up with something which I had uh, suspected to involve what we now call multiple zeta values. I call them a, a double sum. And we were able to establish a dictionary between the knot whose braid wears is here. And when there were only four of these blobs, a counter term in quantum field theory that involves uh, the multiple zeta value, zeta phi three. Uh, but then he was actually able to take four braids and turn them into uh, 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 diagrams here, for which I was able to actually obtain analytic answers going to, so I could find multiple, uh, triple sums and multiple zeta values associated with the four braid. Okay, so now let me get out of there. And I need to uh, remove myself, go down here, go to new share, and I should be back in my talk. So are we back in business, Karen? Yes. It's not but, full uh, screen though. It's- uh, uh, Yeah, you'd like full screen, wouldn't you? Well, you might. <laughs> so let's get rid of the picture of me. And now I'm, I'm on the slides. So we associated families of positive knots with combinations of multiple zeta values. 
and our dictionary between knots and numbers exploited something which I had discovered, which I call the pushdown of multiple zeta values to alternating sums of lesser depth. We'll see an example of that later. In other words, things which are quadruple sums of weight 12 as multiple zeta values can be expressed in terms of alternating sums, which are only depth two. And it was these depth two things that were coming out of uh, Dick's uh, dictionary between knots and numbers um, in situations where with multiple zeta values, we would need a quadruple sums. So this is the infamous broadhurst Kreimer conjecture for the number of primitive multiple zeta values of weight n and depth k. Uh, it's a generating function uh, here. It involves two variables. If I put y equals one, it means I don't care about k. I just take all of the, knots of, uh, all of the multiple zeta values of weight n then I end up with something that's absolutely intuitive. This tells me that zeta three exists and this tells me that pi squared exists. So the whole of the enumeration of multiple zeta values is, uh, is produced by letters. And this is proven at the motivic. That's a conjecture of uh, um, Don Zaguier that's proven at the motivic level and Francis Brown has an explicit uh, basis in terms of uh, um, multiple zeta values whose uh, exponents are, are two and three. But this term, this came out of the observation that at weight 12 and depth two, there was some speaking between depth two uh, uh, and depth four. And it was just the beginning of something that continued to all weights and the way it continues in this generating function, uh, it turns into wonderful uh, numbers verified in the multiple zeta value domain actually uh, is the same function as enumerates the, um, uh, of the cusp forms of the fundamental uh, modular group that we had no, uh, no, 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 no that was never in our heads when we did this. This was just to fit in with ob observations, empirical observations of multiple theta values. Now our results included all the primitive contributions to the beta function of phi to the fourth. Primitive means free of some divergences. We didn't sit down and do all the <coughs> Renormalization of the um, uh, 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 of the sum divergence well, as, until recently, as you heard. Um, but we knew that the number content could not be bigger than this. You always see the the new numbers and the primitives, and we were keen to identify the numbers that could occur at seven loops. Now here as well, you see, this is not even wrong because it's just a game that Dick's invented. When I say I'm associating them, I'm doing them because he's told me that he's got from the braid word for this positive knot to some diagram. And I say, I can find the multiple zeta values. But what, what we were hoping was, and turned out to be the case, that he could give me clues as to what combinations of multiple zeta values to try and fit the diagrams of at seven loops in phi to the fourth theory based upon our previous experiments. And that's, that's much more difficult. Uh, I can't see what I've written at the bottom of the slide, but I'm sure you can. But what Dick had to do was to open the, the, the four valent vertices of phi to the fourth theory. And you can do that in three different ways, S, T and U channels. Uh, and so he had many possibilities for routing the mentor and he had to turn these into link diagrams and he had to scan those link diagrams to produce knots and identify the knots. But it worked. Or oh, it worked when it was well enough defined that they were sure about something and, um, and there were times where we ended up not being able to use this thing to identify numbers but it turned out that there was a good reason for that. So what is the association? You can find this in our papers, but they're very nicely summarized in Dick's book. Well, I've already told you that the zeta three is associated with this. It's a two braid. It means I only need one generator of the, of the braid group to tell me whether I've crossed over the next one. And if I raise it to the power two K plus one, it's associated with zeta of two K plus one. But now look here, this is the three, four torus knot. It's a three braid. So I need two uh, 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 generators, sigma one and sigma two, and I raise them to the power four. So it's going to be an eight crossing knot. And wonderful to relate, straight out of Dick's, uh, not, not knowing that uh, um, um, I had a number waiting, zeta five, three, 
he, he associated zeta phi three, this double sum, um, but something much more specific, not zeta phi three is can occur in combinations with zeta five and zeta three and, and zeta of eight. And what we discovered was that these alternating sums where you uh, now allow a sign, zeta phi three would just be the sum of m greater than n greater than zero, one upon m to the five, n to the three. If you put a minus sign in here, which we indicate by a bar and subtract off it, this is the not number associated by the counter terms of field theory to the knot called 819, the only positive knot with eight crossings, uh, which is the th called the three four torus knot. And now uh, at seven loops, uh, I could draw seven loop diagrams, not five to the fourth diagrams, which he could, uh, which, uh, he could arrive at from the uh, three five torus knot. And we asked ourselves, now what happens here? You see, I'm at weight 10. I haven't yet hit the place where multiple zeta values become mysterious. Uh, zeta 2k plus 5, 3 occurs at k plus 6 loops. Um, um, but at 8 loops, or maybe beyond, but first at 8 loops in the diagrams that I was doing, I think Oliver finds has to go to higher loops and find to the fourth to find this uh, number. We encounter n9, 3, but also this number n75 with this very precise term in pi. And at nine loops and beyond, uh, again, we weren't necessarily looking at five to the fourth diagrams, we find a weight 14. Uh, uh, um, oh, oh, by, by the way, this number here is not expressible in terms of multiple zeta values of weight, uh, of depth two. You have to go up to depth four. Uh, and at nine loops, uh, we, um, we encountered uh, truly uh, depth four polylogarithms, multiple zeta values that don't push down. And we found these very precise numbers down here, combinations of pi and these very nice things. Can you see God really loves the uh, odd integers. He hates pi squared and uh, uh, zeta phi three and zeta phi three, three, three. That's seven loops. Dick emphatically identified the occurrence of this uh, uh, four braid 11 crossing positive knot. There are only two positive knots with 11 crossings. One of them is the, uh, uh, the two um, 11 um, uh, torus knot, just sigma one to the uh, power 11. Um, and the only other positive knot, there are a thousand knots or so to, to, uh, to look at, um, uh, has this braid word. And for this, he always got uh, diagrams which I could evaluate to involve triple sums in this precise combination. I don't know, uh, zeta 353 three minus zeta 3 times zeta 53. Uh, of course, you could have any, add a, an any multiple of zeta over 11 because there's another knot that corresponds to that. But we were able now to find the precise combinations of triple sums associated with uh, a family of, of, of uh, four braids we're now talking about at depth three, um, which gave diagrams which I could evaluate. So it was a really exciting time. So now we're interested, well, you know, um, how fast do positive knots grow and how fast do multiple zeta values grow? And, and, and can we find uh, families of knots that might be associated uh, with multiple zeta values uh, indefinitely. Um, <coughs> and we identified five families. Here you see a two braid, here you see a three braid, uh, and here you see uh, families of, of four braids. And, um, uh, you know, you can write down all sorts of braid words that correspond to the same knots that are Reidermeister moves that turn one into the other. Uh, now, one way of uh, um, trying to um, work out which knot you've got um, from some braid presentation that Dick likes because it gives me counter terms that I can calculate is to look at some polynomial associated with the knot. And the best one on the market is called the Homfly polynomial. These are the initial letters of the six authors whose names have been always forgotten because the acronym is much more memorable. And it depends upon two variables. And we were able to do something quite remarkable, namely for these knots with these positive braids to find an expression 
for all crossing numbers of these families in terms of these two parameters. I've, you can see they're quite ornate formulas. This is extremely useful, you see, because I can then investigate uh, relationships between my counter terms and, and not. So I, I don't necessarily have to have them in these presentations. If Dick comes up with some different braid word, all I do is calculate the Homfly polynomial of his braid word and I look it up in my table. So what about the multiplicities? And again, I can't see the bottom of my slide, which contains the really important information. So I'm going to cheat a little bit so at least I can see it. Um, uh, we looked at, now knots grow enormously. So we, we, we said, we're interested in positive knots. And we went to the best uh, knotters in the world and asked them how many positive knots. And they said, that's an impossibly difficult question for us. We can't even tell you, we, we know that there are only two with 11 crossings. And I said, well, I, I worked that out in, uh, in, uh, in five minutes of CPU time on my, uh, on my uh, 25 year old laptop. Uh, but can, what, can you tell us here? And they said, no, it's too difficult. So we were interested, we, we worked it out ourselves. We assume that the Homfly polynomial is not faithful. It doesn't always distinguish knots. If two, if two knots have different Homfly polynomials, they're different. And if they have the same one, they're likely to be the same, but, but there are counterexamples. And we assume that those positive knots were really rather um, scarce in the great panoply of knots that the Homfly polynomial was uh, faithful for those. And so I was able to generate a quarter of a million braid words and work out their, um, work out their Homfly polynomials and work out how many there were. And eventually uh, the knot theorists, I think 10 years later, verified this calculation that I did one afternoon in Tasmania. And uh, uh, I still haven't seen that. We put this in the encyclopedia of uh, 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 of online sequences, but I still haven't seen any, whether anyone has uh, 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 validated this number. I'd be surprised if it was wrong. Now, what you can see down here is that these are increasing much faster than um, the uh, 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 multiple zeta values. But this is what's so remarkable that things started off in parallel. You see, D Dick didn't know this. All he knew was about zeta three, zeta five, and zeta seven. He didn't know that the first multiple zeta value occurs as zeta phi three at weight eight. And I didn't know that there was a unique positive knot with eight crossings. Uh, here at nine, there's just zeta of nine. Here, we're picking up things with these two positive knots, zeta, giving zeta 11 and zeta three phi three. But at 10 crossings, we first found a knot to which I couldn't associate uh, a counter term that gave multiple zeta values. Um, so what we looked for, and so this is, let us, and, and, and you look at the enumeration of multiple zeta values, so we can already see that knots are more prolific than multiple zeta values and primitive multiple zeta values. So we imagine that only a subset of knots could be associated with these multiple zeta values. And actually these families work very well uh, uh, by associations uh, when I get up to weight 17. Experts might think at weight 15, I would need a five braid, but in fact, because of push down, I have to go to weight 17. Then here we were missing a knot, but we reckoned eventually we would, someone could find a knot associated with these two extra multiple, multiple zeta values. But here you can see why we were led to believe that quantum field theory would outgrow multiple zeta values. Maybe it was even outgrowing it here at, uh, um, uh, at seven loops in phi to the fourth theory. So what really happens at seven loops? Well, we found that there were two positive knots with 10 crossings. Dick can remember their numbers in the uh, 10, 1, 3, 5, and 10, 1, 5, 1, 5, 9. I can't remember them now. But we couldn't associate to multiple zeta values. And there were three counter terms at seven loops, which we couldn't identify. And so we concluded, or at least this led us to believe that multiple zeta values would not suffice for five to the fourth counter terms. And I'm saying this in case Francis Brown is listening because um, uh, Francis is under the impression that we, uh, we thought that uh, uh, we would always get multiple zeta values as Feynman periods and that that was the origin of the Konsevich uh, conjecture um, on uh, uh, um, zeros of the, uh, of the semantic polynomials and fin uh, over finite fields. But in fact, here Francis in the published paper is what we did say, positive knots 
and hence their transcendentals associated in biofield theory are richer in structure than MZVs. Thank you, David. I am listening. <laughs> Thank you. Now, the great thing is, and I said to Maxim, it's wonderful that Maxim uh, didn't, uh, 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 didn't understand what, we, what our intuition was, because he made this very strong conjecture um, uh, just on, 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 on uh, uh, whether or not the uh, numbers of zeros of the semantic polynomial of finite fields was a polynomial in Q. And the, and the combinatorists found that this worked up to 12 edges for every graph. Not talking about fiber diagrams, right? Every graph in the world satisfied this Gonsavich conjecture. Uh, and they were a bit miffed about that. that uh, um, but in fact, um, uh, Maxime had already told me, he said, I think something goes wrong with the Farno matroid. And later, uh, uh, Belcale and Brosnan had a non constructive disproof of the Konsevis conjecture. Non-constructive in the following sense, they said if Maxine was right for all um, graphs, then he would be right for all matroids, but we know that he's wrong for a matroid, so he must be wrong for a graph. Uh, but that's completely non-constructive. It's a wonderful piece of mathematics. But the thing was, we were already precisely at seven loops at 14 edges with unidentified things. So what did we find? Did we find some things that weren't multiple zeta values? Well, eventually, uh, it took me quite a long time, increase of computing power. Uh, um, uh, uh, I was able to identify two of these. They're called in Oliver Schnepps's tables, the uh, uh, periods of... Uh, uh, at seven loops and the, the eighth and the ninth in the table down there. And they involve this uh, weight 11 combination that we find. Notice weight 11, uh, the knots not associated with these chain crossing knots. And it was related to multiple zeta values, but there was a new number. This new number zeta phi three minus 29 zeta of eight is not the combination that we've seen before. And here it gets multiplied by zeta of three. So we can claim no credit at all the um, uh, a relationship between knot theory and here we have no new we have a uh, a new type of combination of numbers occurring uh, in terms of all multiple zeta values uh, and the wonderful thing that here is that the uh, these two reductions in the multiple zeta values surprised I think uh, Francis because what he had predicted was that alternating sums would, well, he actually says for all of the seven loop diagrams, uh, multiple polylogarithms of roots of unity up to six would suffice. And that's exactly what happens. But for these, the diagnostic that was given by something called the C2 invariant was that they should really involve alternating sums. And I had obtained uh, some time in I think about 2010, these expressions from here, which were not alternating sums. Now, you've heard of the enormous increase in, 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 in ability to, to calculate that has come from Eric Pantz's hyperint and Oliver Schnetz's um, graphical functions. And uh, these are quite difficult graphs. Eric was able to do one, but not the other, vice versa uh, uh, for Oliver. And both of them attained in their respective domains Nate combinations of alternating sums, very much as Francis had led them to expect. But then they have the multiple seat of data mine, which Johannes Blonlein and Josfer Masser and I had developed, which also includes alternating sums. And using that, they were able to prove the reductions that I found empirically. The remaining seven loop counter term, number 11 in the census of uh, um, seven loop periods, uh, was predicted by Francis to reduce the polylogarithms of six roots of unity, and that was done by Eric in a most amazing feat of analysis. And here I uh, comment on something that um, uh, was mentioned uh, by Oliver Schnetz, namely that at eight loops, polylogarithms of all type fail to deliver uh, 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 all of the counter terms. So there's a period at eight loops in flight of the fourth theory whose obstruction to polylogarithmic uh, reduction 
comes from a singular K3 surface. Wow, you know. Uh, but it's uh, associated with a uh, cusp form of modular weight three that's the most beautiful cusp form you can think of. Uh, it involves complex multiplication, the square root of minus seven. It's just the data can eat of z times the data can eat of seven z to the power three. Uh, it's related to the symmetric square of an elliptic curve with conductor 49. So here's now my very subjective summary is that Dirk's intuition based uh, on uh, our explanations of relationships between knots and numbers that multiple zeta values would not suffice at seven loops was borne out uh, uh, by later analysis, though the really non-polar logarithmic action is here. So now I think I have, uh, according to my recollection, 10 minutes left for the four term relation. Now this is either right or wrong. So let me say what it is. I, I ask you to imagine that you have a graph in which you can draw a Hamiltonian circuit. That's a circle that passes through all of the vertices once and once only. There are certain graphs called Peterson graphs where you can't do that, but the majority of graphs that you can. So now just take three little bits of those circles down here, these three little arcs, and find a chord that connects these top two arcs. And the four terms we will get is by connecting this arc at the bottom to here, 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 and here. Yeah. Now what all about what, what about the rest of the graph? Um, well, the four term relationship doesn't care about it. It says what el whatever else is happening, how these are joined up in the Hamiltonian circuit and what else happens at other points in the Hamiltonian circuit. As long as they're the same, then there could be a four term relation. And what Dick wondered was whether this was the case for the counter terms of quantum field theory. And what we ended up, uh, Dick has a published paper in which he asserts that he has a proof for a very strong argument that there is a four term relation of the following five conditions are met. First of all, that each of the terms is free of subdivergences, then it would have a, a new, unique number associated with it when we nullify the external momenta, put all the masses equal to zero and uh, um, uh, find the coefficient of logarithmic divergence. Uh, that they should differ only by the subgraphs known. The, the uh, shown, that's just saying, I've just defined what that means. But now there are three extra conditions. And I'll explain where these came from. They came from, in the first instance, from experiment and not from pure thought. They should have trivial vertices. In other words, just constant vertices like in phi to the fourth uh, theory or, or phi cube theory or, um, or Yukawa theory but not vectorial couplings, not, not the gamma mu's that you get uh, when fermions couple to, um, um, uh, uh, to photons, the gauge bosons. And they should have no propagator with spin greater than half. So there should be no, uh, you, you can't have vectorial couplings and you can't have internal vector bosons. And each of these four terms should modify one of the dimensionless couplings of a renormalizable field theory. Now, uh, the paper which I wrote with Dick on Dick's, in, uh, Dick's instructions, we said the necessity of these set of provisos is not established. But Dick claims that they're sufficient to derive a four term relation. For the counter terms, the coefficients of overall logarithmic divergence of each of these four diagrams which I've labeled in cyclic order. And the counter terms are easily calculated. We nullify the external momenta, throw away the internal masses. We cut the diagram wherever we please uh, to get a, two point, a finite two point function, which we evaluate to the best of our ability. Uh, and uh, uh, there's no problem with the R star operation. There are no infrared problems that are excluded by the provisors. Okay. So was I able to test this? Well, here's the full loop test. It's in Yukawa plus phi to the fourth theory. So this double line here is a, uh, is, is, is a fermion. And here is a Yukawa coupling. 
there's a loop with a scalar particle, and this X is the coupling to some external uh, uh, scalar particle. Um, and what I've done down here, uh, you can't with theory, by the way, is not renormalizable by itself. It, it generates a, uh, uh, a fine to the fourth coupling that you have to renormalize. So you can only have you can't with theory as in the standard model in conjunction with phi to the fourth theory. So I'm going to imagine I have a phi to the fourth vertex here. I've connected three of its valences to the fermion here and the four term relation that Dirk is predicting occurs when I uh, connect the fourth valence of this phi to the fourth vertex, either here or here or here or here. Now we were able to do this because then we nullify everything for each of the four terms. I've just written them out explicitly down here. And of course I cut this here because then it's very easy because when I cut it here, I just detach this, uh, um, this, um, uh, uh, one loop diagram that uh, 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 that I can do, and I'm really only left with uh, with three loops left to do. Um, here, uh, I, I chose to cut down here, and you can write down explicit formulas down here. You know, from, they come from the Feynman rules, but here is a uh, an integration measure that I define for an arbitrary number of uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, d dimensional integrations over um, uh, internal momenta. To make the numbers nice, I work in what's called the G scheme, where you take out uh, the gamma factors that come from uh, 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 come from uh, <coughs> uh, uh, simple one loop diagrams. And uh, here now is the precise four numbers that Dirk is talking about, and he's interested in the limit epsilon goes to zero down here, and they just involve the two and the three loop measures here, the two loop ones with uh, this combination of a mentor. And uh, you don't need a, a fancy computer program to do this. You can more or less do the, you can do these two loop integrals in your head because you've got my result for the wheel with n spokes down here. And all you have to work out is how that rule is modified. You know, if I have d mu two giving me zeta of three, how it gets modified here and here by scalar products. And all that does is multiply by some thing which goes to a constant as epsilon goes to zero. So that was two, that was two of the diagrams, the easy ones, these ones here. The other ones really involve some uh, um, uh, some real um, uh, 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 um, three loop uh, 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 integrals. And uh, I had written my own version of what was then called uh, Mensa, and uh, I had it on reviews, uh, reduce on my calculator. But we didn't need uh, we didn't need that uh, that full machinery. We were able to use integration by parts to turn a three loop integral into a two loop integral at the price of introducing uh, fractional powers of the momenta in there. And that's where I work with John Gracie. Uh, well, work with John was developed afterwards, but the uh, discussion that I've had with John Gracie before um, was very useful because that final step was accomplished by developing epsilon expansions of Salschutzian F32 series um, to obtain the two difficult terms and the X4 term relation was satisfied. So now I've only got two more slides to go, I think. If we replace the Yukawa couplings by gamma mu, and this was my discovery, this was all done in the morning. Great excitement among Bob de Borgo and Peter Jarvis and Johannes when Dirk's four term relation had been verified by David in the morning. But in the afternoon, I put in vector vertices and it completely fails. So the restriction to vector vertices was post hoc, but Dirk explains in his single author paper um, how that is sufficient for him. But then at five loops, I could immediately do, well, not immediately, but with present technology, because I'd already calculated the, 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 uh, the five loop uh, uh, anomalous field dimension, indeed the five loop renormalized, uh, uh, renormalized propagator of phi to the fourth theory. Um, uh, so here now I'm looking at a non-renormalizable theory that involves a phi to the fifth interaction, but I'm still have got a, log, a, a subdivergence free counter term for the coupling of two fermions to two scalars and the four term relation here 
it's got just the same as before. I have a considerably more difficult integrals to do, but the important thing is you can see that the four term relation fails spectacularly. So that's the origin of the proviso in Dirk's paper that we have renormalizable things. So now my final slide, I think more or less on time, which is an exercise for modern quantum computation. I like this phrase from uh, Oliver's talk, quantum computation. So first of all, I've got a question for Dirk because this is the type of question that I always used to ask him as soon as I had an idea. Last night, I drew this diagram, Dirk, and I hope that it's free of subdivergences, but I know that you will be able to cast your eye over it very quickly and tell me if I'm wrong. But what I've done down here, I want to work in Yukawa plus phi to the fourth theory. And so here I've written a, uh, a two loop uh, correction to the uh, fermion propagator, uh, but I made jolly well sure to put my Yukawa cupping in the middle so that I, each of these uh, loops is already convergence and I've only got an overall logarithmic divergence. And then for my phi to the fourth vertex, I've coupled uh, to make this nice Hamiltonian circuit I've coupled here. Uh, uh, and, the, and the four term relation, which according to Dick's paper must hold because it satisfies all of the provisos will be gotten by connecting to these four points. So providing I haven't made a mistake, this is one of many. I mean, the, the, the constructions become quite rich down here. So here's a question for Eric and Mishi and Oliver, maybe for Eric, because Eric, uh, I don't know if you know, we should celebrate the fact that he has his second five year um, uh, fellowship uh, in Oxford. So he'll be in Oxford for 10 years. And I've been telling him he should be starting supervising some graduate students. So here's a nice little master's exercise for someone who wants to do some applied calculations uh, down here. Uh, can you disprove Dirk Kreimer's claim that providing this is free of subdivergence, it's a renormalizable quantum field theory. It doesn't involve vector particles. It doesn't involve gamma mu's. Uh, 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 and then for Michi and uh, um, and Oliver, what about phi cubed in six dimensions? Because that was what Dick wanted me to work with. All of his knots um, were related to trivalent vertices. So here's a little exercise. Was Dick right or wrong? And I come to my summary. It's a very short and a very heartfelt summary. I'm going to read it. Stop myself cracking up. Dick is a skillful analyst, an inspiring combinatoricist and a deeply influential algebraic thinker. But more than all of that, he combines these gifts with a quiet self-confidence and a great concern for colleagues. This has enriched my life and many others. So thank you, Dirk. Thanks, David. Thank you to David, yes. <laughs>